Well, good evening. <clears throat> Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, very uh, good speaker tonight. Tell you a little bit about her in just a moment. Um, but we are gathered in church. Today is the feast of a church building. Usually we don't have feast days of a building. Usually feast days are of people, saints, heroic Christian men and women. Today is a feast of a building. It's a church building, St. John Lateran Cathedral in Rome, which is the Cathedral Church of Rome. Most people think St. Peter's Basilica, but that would be wrong. St. John Lateran is the actual cathedral, even though the Pope lives at St. Peter's. The Popes traditionally lived at St. John Lateran, but in the Middle Ages shifted over to St. Peter's Basilica. And so in celebrating the Cathedral Church, we're celebrating the Pope, our Holy Father, Pope Francis. So we want to pray for him tonight in his important work. Every diocese has a, bishop, has a cart, cathedral, church. Uh, and in that cathedral, there's a special chair, the cathedra, a Latin word, uh, which is a symbol of the bishop's teaching authority. Just as a king has a throne, a symbol of his ruling authority, a bishop's church, the cathedral, has a cathedra, the symbol of his teaching authority as a successor of the apostles. So we pray for the Catholic Church around the world tonight. Um, for its continued conversion, renewal, reform, and we also pray for Pope Francis. So why don't we kneel down as we start tonight, we'll say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we believe that you are here, present in this tabernacle, in this church building, even as we celebrate the church building of St. John Lateran in Rome. Jesus, they are churches because you are present in them. They are your house. They are your temple. You see us here tonight, Lord. We come to honor and worship you. We come to learn our Catholic faith. We come to learn how to apply it in our family lives, and our marriages. That our families might be little churches in our homes where we learn to pray, where we learn about you, where we learn right and wrong, where we learn how to practice charity and virtues toward each other of charity, patience, service, forgiveness, generosity, love. Jesus, bless all the families of our parishes, St. Louis and St. Francis of Assisi, with all their hopes and struggles. Bless couples in their marriages, bless parents in their important work of raising their children, informing them and loving them. Bless our talk tonight, bless Anne and her presentation, bless our listening we might receive what you wish to give us. Bless our Holy Father, Pope Francis, on this feast day. We pray with you, Jesus, to the Father, for our Holy Father, as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. We make this prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So a little bit about our speaker and presenter tonight. Her name is Anne Royals Witz. Uh, Anne's brother... Father Andrew Royals is a friend of mine. He's a priest of the Archdiocese of Washington. So it was partly through Father Andrew that I met Anne. So very glad that she could be with us tonight. She crossed the line from the Archdiocese of Washington into the Archdiocese of Baltimore, but lives not far from here. Anne is a wife and mother and educator. She is the Maryland leader for Canavox, Canavox, which is an organization that gives a natural law voice for marriage and sexuality, a great movement in our Catholic Church, not just for Catholics. She recently joined the Brookwood School faculty to teach great moral story stories to grades K through 12 and the history of film course to juniors and seniors. After graduating from Providence College herself, Anne was the director of an elementary school inner city academic and leadership program in Washington, D.C. While serving as a dedicated home educator for 12 years, and also taught high school English and character education seminars in a local school. She has taught homeschool groups and led middle, high school, and college reading groups. She and her husband, Peter, 
parent as a team, encouraging their six children to choose the true, the good, and the beautiful, and also the best dance party songs. So as a connoisseur of dance party songs, we, we walk a man bits with us here tonight. Good evening. Thank you, Father Diascanis, uh, for the invitation to come join the community this evening. Um, I'm really moved by this parish. Um, I was kind of researching a little bit about you all and looking at your parish website, and I'm struck how tonight's topic um, that Father chose, how to wisely and intentionally cultivate family time, um, really rings true to your parish. As he mentioned, I have a brother who's also a parish priest, and I know the love that he brings as a father to his parish family. So seeing these events like tonight, that you come together as a parish community with this sense of wisely and intentionally cultivating this parish family was just very moving to me. So I'm, I'm very happy to be welcomed here by, by the parish this evening, and, and thank you for having me. So who am I? Uh, we had that introduction, which is great. Um, I'm getting ready to celebrate my 18th wedding anniversary this New Year's Eve. Um, we have six children, three boys and three girls. So our monthly family cooking date nights pretty much always turn into family dance parties. And it works out really well to have three and three because everybody has a dance partner. Um, our children range in age from first grade, that's our baby. Um, and our oldest is a senior in high school, so pray for me. We're in the middle of, we, well, not in the middle of the applying process. We've applied everywhere. We're in the middle of figuring out what these next steps are gonna be. Um, as he mentioned, I'm also an educator, uh, working with inner city youth, um, as he mentioned, that home education component, uh, working with students at Brookwood through Canavox. Um, so education is a passion of mine. Um, and why am I telling you all of this about you know, who I am and what it is that I do? I want you to know that like you, I'm very much in the trenches. Uh, my husband and I are striving to build, celebrate, and maintain our Witz family culture of faith and love in the midst of a world that at times seems like it wants nothing, nothing more than to tear it apart. So like you, my husband and I are in it to win it. I do not claim to be an expert, um, though I will present the evidence from some of the experts. Rather, like you, I'm a fellow traveler. I have some insights and suggestions that might help make your way a little smoother as we all navigate building our family cultures. I'm gonna ask for a quick show of hands. How many of you currently are parents of toddlers? Okay, this is helpful for me to know who, to whom I'm speaking. How many of us here tonight have elementary school children? Okay, all right. How many of us are middle school parents? Okay, and how many of us are high school parents? All right, we've got a good spread here. How many of us have college students? Okay, how many of us are grandparents? Nice. This is fabulous, okay, great. This is good for me to know, to get to know you a little bit more. Um, and just knowing you know, who we are on this journey together. Um, I also just cannot emphasize enough the value of that grandparent relationship. Um, you know, that sense of kinship is what really gives us roots. Um, and it's a very special relationship, the grandparent to the grandchild. So welcome everybody. Um, tonight, as we consider how to wisely and intentionally cultivate family time, we're gonna kind of think about this sense of listen so that they will talk, talk and so that they will listen. We're gonna focus on three main areas. First, that time is precious and family time is priceless. Second, we're gonna look at seven habits of highly effective families according to Stephen Covey. And we're gonna consider communication masters and disasters so see what we can learn from the Gottmans and apply it to family communication. All right, so first off, 
this idea that time is precious and family time is priceless. We need to know that cultivating meaningful family time is worth it. We must expect that good things are coming and we should find friends to encourage us. We have 24 hours in a day, 168 hours in a week. There's so much discussion out there about productivity, how we can increase our productivity, how can we can make best use of time. And this is all great and very valuable. But how am I cultivating the key relationships in my life within that time? My relationship with God, with my spouse, with my family, with my friends. Without God, we can do nothing. With God, we can do so much more and so much more effectively. Our day can be lived as a running monologue. I need to do this. Shucks, I forgot to do that. What am I going to do next? Me, 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 I, 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 my goals, my needs, what, I, you know, what do I have to get done? Or it can be lived as a running dialogue. Lord, what do we need to do right now? Lord, what do you need me to do right now? Lord, help us try and, you know, we really should ask the Lord to help us try and live in dialogue with him, not this running monologue. So do I recognize that if I intend to do anything intentionally, it will help me to pray about it and to align my intention with God? So let's really try to make that effort. It can be a goal for us tonight. Um, to make the effort out of love, to spend some time in prayer with God. 10 to 15 minutes a day is a good start if this is a new, a new practice for us. I remember many years, especially during those 12 years when I was home full time, um, I loved my afternoon coffee date with the Lord. I was never gonna miss that afternoon cup of coffee. And by bringing prayer, seeing that kind of coupling it, that habit stacking, have my cup of coffee, but have it with the Lord, that little coffee date every day, um, an opportunity to just refocus, recenter, find peace in conversation with the Lord. So maybe it's coming 10 minutes, 15 minutes early before a daily mass, or seeing if we can stay those 10 to 15 minutes afterwards for that prayer time here in the church in the presence of the Lord, resting in the Lord, it could also just be embracing the reality of our lives. Maybe it's recognizing how many hours we spend in the car and spending 10 to 15 minutes while we're waiting for that sports practice to end, to have that, that spiritual journal and to have that prayer book that we can just turn those 15 minutes of waiting into 15 minutes of prayer. Seek and you will find those moments each day that you can begin to cultivate that habit of turning towards the Lord in daily prayer. It may seem like a little and insignificant thing, but I promise you'll get so much out of it. And the need for making this type of a spiritual game plan shouldn't come as a surprise to us when you consider um, how dedicated many of us are about a workout routine. Um, we wanna push ourselves without hurting ourselves. We may have an, academic tr uh, an athletic trainer that we work with. Um, or, you know, medically guided nutritional diets. You will not will your cholesterol down. Um, so it's really no surprise that when we, can, when we see the need for a game plan with so many other aspects of our life, coming up with a spiritual game plan is also really important. And so a key part will be finding that time for prayer every day. Let's also make time for our spouse. We could fill an entire other evening talking about strengthening communication in marriage. Um, I'll just give you one brief little recommendation. So this is Eight Dates, Essential Conversations for a Lifetime of Love by John Gottman and Julie Schwartz Gottman. Um, the topics of conversation for each date are crucial for joyful relationships. It is a secular source, it's not perfect, but the key nuggets um, from the topics and the, the way to communicate with your spouse about it are really, really helpful. Some of the ideas are building trust and commitment, addressing conflict, work and money, family, extended family. This could be a valuable resource to you. And I remember um, the invaluable wisdom of a priest family friend of ours at one point. Um, I think at the time I had three. 
and I was just in love with being a mother. And I wanted so much to be, the to be the best mother I could possibly be. And I remember asking for some advice. And his response, so simple, so true. Annie, love Pete. So it was clear. For me to be the best mom I could be, it was really loving my husband and taking care of that primary relationship. And when we do that, that's going to overflow in into how we take care of our children. So make time for our spouse. Um, make time for our family. We'll go into this a little bit more later, but this idea of planning our family time. Um, it's not about the Instagram perfect turkey. You know, we might think of family time and immediately think of that Norman Rockwell painting of the family gathered around the table and there's that turkey right there in the middle and everybody's so excited, you know, ready to dig in. That's beautiful. It's not about perfect. It is about creating a family culture that they are going to want to return to for rest, for love, for nourishment, for conversation, encouragement, merriment, joy, and peace. We should expect that good things are coming. I'm sure we all have heard um, a lot of well-intended jokes that still come out a little bit negative. Oh, you're gonna have your third child, get ready to be outnumbered. Um, the terrible twos are the worst. You think this is bad, just wait till they're in high school. Wait until they're teenagers. It may be difficult at times to be a parent, um, but we're at our best when we do hard things, and it's worth it. About the terrible twos, I'm just gonna share quickly, and knowing that we have a number here with, with toddlers and little ones, it's just a way to reframe this idea of those terrible twos. This comes to us from Kaylee Christensen. Everyone warned me about the toddler year, she says. The terrible twos, the tantrums, the tears, the testing of boundaries, all the dramatics. And right now we're in it. We have officially entered the toddler years. It's fair to say that I've been thoroughly warned in every way, which way the tantrums and the fits, the demanding, independent, but also needy, sometimes defiant tantrum stage. Many have told us this is the most trying stage yet. But let me tell you a little secret about this trying stage we're in right now. This stage, this terrible two stage, it's my favorite so far. It's your daddy's favorite too. Because this is the stage where you first said the words, love you too, mommy. It's the stage when you found fun and wrestling daddy to the ground in the living room, laughter radiating through the entire house. It's this stage where you reach for mommy's hand while watching cartoons and then turn toward her and give her a smile. Now don't get me wrong, this stage can be so hard. The days can feel so long. The tears can seem endless. But the secret no one told me about the toddler years is how much I could absolutely love it. Nobody warned me about the beauty within the terrible twos. Sweet boy, we talk about much about how we want to freeze you, freeze time. We want to freeze your sweet voice, your still so chubby thighs, your relentless love, your rambunctious personality. We even want to freeze your tantrums and your tears. So instead of wishing the hard days away, wishing for time to speed up, I don't want even for a second to wish these toddler years away. Maybe that means a lot to me these days because I'm out of the toddler phase, but that idea of reframing. Yes, it can be hard. Yes, it can be like the nitty gritty of just getting through the next five minutes or 10 minutes can seem daunting and impossible, but it's so worth it. And there's delight in every moment. Um, same thing with those high school years. I remember when I was in the toddler stage, I'm um, hearing a lot of that negativity. Oh, you think this tantrum's bad? Just wait for high school. And kind of thinking, oh no, what's gonna come next? And then I do remember a good friend of my mom pulling me aside and she, and she said to me, you know, Annie, I love the high school years. They were great. Their personalities are really emerging, their interests, the conversations you have. Just you wait for those high school years. So now that I'm in the high school years and loving the high school years, I'm currently at the time where I'm getting ready to realize college is around the corner. And I was talking with a good friend of mine saying, oh, so here I am, you know, these years have been fabulous and, and I'm feeling like, you know, it's the end of an era. You know, this is gonna be so hard saying goodbye to my first baby. How could we possibly be at this stage in life? And this friend, she goes, you know, Annie, some of the best conversations I remember having were when the kids would come home from college 
and everybody would be gathered around that kitchen table late into the night just sharing ideas, just loving being together. So basically what I'm trying to say is there's hardships in every phase of, of loving and parenting and mothering and fathering our children, but it's sweet, it's wonderful, it's worth it. Good things are here and good things are going to continue to come our way. This idea that it's really important to find people that will support our hopes for building a positive family culture. We have to make that time to recharge with them. There is strength in numbers. It's also a lot more fun in numbers too. Sunday brunches could be lunches, right? Um, in our family, we have the tradition where first Sunday is always spent with my extended family. Um, kinship roots our existence. Um, the second Sunday, it's our intimate family, so just the Vitz household on, you know, in, in Durwood. The third Sunday, we get together with Peter's side of the family. And then that fourth Sunday for a brunch, we try to get together with you know, a family or a couple of families. Uh, let's reclaim Sunday as a day to rest and recharge. Um, a gift for my husband and I has been those Cane of Ox reading groups. Uh, we host two a month with other couples. We get together to share our experiences, go through readings, um, to, just, to, to really just cheer each other along the way, to celebrate the truth. Four Seasons dinner parties. I remember, gosh, 10 years ago now, um, four couples, friends of ours, we decided we had, we had we'd been friends for a long time. Some of us knew each other from high school and we had done a marriage workshop together and we were getting together uh, regularly for about six months. And when it ended, we thought, oh, we're gonna really miss this time together. So we said, why not have dinner parties? There are four couples, four seasons, we rotate houses and each one takes the season. These nights are so much fun. And the years of friendship between us and just the shared laughter conversation, the shared tears, have, it's, it's a true gift. Find a mentor couple, somebody in your parish, somebody in your community, you know, ask them for support, ask them for guidance, um, and be really transparent about it. Um, you and your husband, you know, ask to get together with them and ask them the words, say, would you consider being our mentor couple? You know, we see, we see your family life, we see your marriage, and it's so inspiring to us. Would you consider being a mentor couple? Maybe you're in the, in the stage of marriage and family life where you recognize you could be a mentor couple to others without going up to them the opposite. Don't be quite so transparent and say, would you like for us to be your mentor couple? Instead, go out of your way though to cultivate friendships with these younger families. They need your support. We need to help each other out. So find those mentor couples. Um, I have a monthly book club with my friends. So the girls, we get together. We've been doing this for 12 years. I love my girlfriends. They're so important to me. My husband can never be one of those girls, right? My husband is so important, but those friendships I have with the ladies, they make me a better wife. They make me a better mom. So we need to take care of those friendships as well. Some of them are people I've known since high school. Some of them I've known since college. Some are professional friends, moms I've gotten to know through the schools. So taking care of that. Um, and then another, I'm just sharing ideas. Okay, another idea is backyard theater initiative. Theater was a huge part of my growth and development, high school and college. Um, I loved it. Some of my friends got that theater bug. They enjoy performing as well. But getting involved in the theater world can be either prohibitively expensive or prog progressively prohibitive. And so two summers ago, my husband and I were looking at different options that were out there for, for high schoolers to get involved in summer theater. And we had a friend who's a professional theater director and we said, hey, Joe, any chance you'd be interested in teaching a bunch of high schoolers, you know, directing them in a summer Shakespeare group in our backyard for two months? Yeah, he was so excited. Let's reclaim the theater culture. Let's get people to love theater. Let's do this. Let's get these families together. So since then it's grown and we're actually having our first winter production of A Christmas Carol this year. So find passions, find interests that you have. Don't be afraid to open your home. Again, we're not looking for Instagram perfect. We're never gonna get that. The sloppy, real messiness of life is what's most attractive. Don't be afraid to open your home and encourage your children 
to invite their friends over. Encourage your children to see your home as a place of gathering for their extended friends. Get to know their friends. Get to know the parents of their friends. Build culture. There's that spiritual, academic, athletic dimension of our children's education that we all know. We, take, you know, we, we make efforts to make sure that we're hitting those marks. Let's not forget that social education that's also really, really important, especially if we can get this in before they go to college. Okay, so we know that family time is priceless. So how can we intentionally cultivate family time? So let's take a look at these seven habits of highly effective families, according to Stephen Covey. They can really help to serve as a great guide. It's interesting that this came out in 1997. Um, and as what, what I understand is that the 90s are trending right now. Styles are throwback to the 90s. Hair fashions are throwback to the 90s. So I think it's pretty great that we're going back to the 90s for building family culture. Let's see what they have to say. All right, so I'll quickly list them, and then we'll take one you know, each at a time and give it, give it a little bit more. So the first habit, you're proactive. You say, I can do it. Habit two, you begin with the end in mind. Habit three, you put first things first. You do what's best for you and your family first. Habit four, you think win-win. Habit five, you seek first to understand, then to be understood. Habit six, you synergize. Habit seven, you sharpen the saw. That means you make time to care for yourself and your family. Okay, so habit one, be proactive. A way to think about this is the idea of making deposits in the emotional bank account. Um, deposits build trust. Um, the value of apologies are big in terms of you know, making these deposits into that emotional bank account. Um, and not just those simple, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the trust builder really comes when it's, I'm sorry, name the person for what it is concretely that you did. It must have been really hard for you because I recognize that it made you like, so you know, say what it is, that, co that negative effect of what it is you did, and I'll try to, you know, what it is you're gonna try to do better the next time. So a full apology, a sincere apology, can really deposit a lot of, a lot of trust into that bank account. Withdrawals can be those unintentional times we hurt, um, those times of impatience, you know, where we're withdrawing, Sometimes, though, that withdraw can be a big ask. It can seem like something negative, but actually it ends up building trust as well. Sometimes the big ask that we know will be difficult, but good for the family. You know, for example, we might have that high schooler who had their heart set on going to a party one night. Something comes up, mom and dad, you know, we really need to go help support this family, or we really need to go help somebody out here. We need you to stay home and babysit. Oh total letdown, this is terrible. There might be that initial reaction of, oh, right? But we're making a big ask, and when our kids see that this is for a greater good, for a family good, that builds trust, and it also goes towards what Brene Brown calls the sense of moving from just merely compliance to commitment, where they're seeing that sense of, okay, this is important to the family, this is a value of ours, and I buy in. I get that, I see that. So those big asks can actually be um, deposits, not withdraws. The sense of being proactive, um, also that idea about being proactive and not reactive. So again, this is where the importance of our prayer before a decision really comes into play. And if it's a big decision, more prayer. Um, examples of deposits into the bank, just speaking with respect, keeping that high tone of respect in our family culture, meaningful eye contact, putting the phone down, joyfully listening to the song that they want to listen to in the car, making their favorite dinner, filling the gas tank, literally, or in my case, anytime my husband or my son backs our car into the driveway so that when I have to go out in the morning and I can just pull out forward, it feels like love. <laughs> So find those things in your family, know your family, know what's gonna really feel like that deposit. Okay, habit two, begin with the end in mind. 
So here's the idea to make a family mission statement. So my husband and I first heard about this concept through the Art of Manliness blog, and then from there we found out the source through these seven habits. So this idea of the family mission statement, what do I want my family to stand for? What's our end game? In the Vitz family, this is heaven. That is our end game. How can we best get there? And how can we bring as many people along with us? So we say make the treasure map. Heaven's where we know we wanna go. Mark the dangers. We know what treasure maps look like. They're dramatic. They're, they're exciting to see visually. So mark the dangers, the pitfalls along the way. It could be the dreaded quicksand of over committing our family. And keep our eye on the prize and be ready for that sense of adventure. So this idea of beginning with the end in mind, it's important to see how we're staying on track. And that's where goal setting can really help us. Um, checking in with each other, reevaluating as we go along. You know, different phases and stages of family life might call for, for new goals. Um, and even at times, we're just rewriting that mission statement, tweaking it here and there. Habit three, put first things first. This is that visual you may have heard of, of putting in those big rocks. If you've got, that, if you've got the container, first we fill it with the big, the big rocks, and then you pour in all the little pebbles and then you fill it with the sand, and it's amazing how much you can fill in that container. So our big rocks are our most important things, and we can ask ourselves, what do we as a family value most? What needs to get done? Those are our big rocks. Um, he also recommends really trying to see it sometimes just a week at a time, set goals for the week. He talks about five things families should do. So developing a mission statement, Scheduling regular one-on-one -on -one bonding times, regular family meal times, creating weekly family times other than this meal time, and then building these rituals and traditions. So we're getting ready for the holiday season. And in the Vitz family, something that we do for Thanksgiving and that we do for Christmas is we talk, okay, what do you want Thanksgiving to look like? What do you want Christmas to look like? What are your ideas? What's your, what's your vision for it? And sometimes it's completely at odds. One person says, I want quiet and rest. And the other person says, I want to invite families and friends over every single day of the 12 days of Christmas, right? So it might be completely at odds. So it's finding that middle ground for what do we want this to look like? Um, you know, where do we want our, our Christmas mass, our tradition in our family? Every Christmas Eve, we go see my brother, Uncle Father Drew is what my kids call him. Um, so like, what are, what are our goals? What are our visions? How can we make this happen? And this idea that it takes planning, that shouldn't surprise us. Um, it, takes a, it takes a plan to get into action. Don't be afraid to say no. Don't be afraid to say no to even great, fabulous, wonderful invitations. Don't be afraid of that fear of missing out if it means you're putting your family first. Do less with more love of God. Do less with more love of family. He talks about four steps to prioritizing family time. So holding um, that regular one to three hour family time, think outside the box. You know, you may know your family schedule and say, Tuesday nights, it's what we've got. You know, the, the obvious choice for many families is the weekend, but I know families that say Taco Tuesday for the win, and it becomes really a tradition. Every Tuesday, everybody's at home. Um, and really having everybody involved um, and everybody there in attendance. So teenagers, um, I remember this is something my parents did, much to my chagrin at the time, but now I'm seeing the wisdom. The idea that when the weekend comes, you might have one night that you're out with your family, that, sorry, one night where you're out with your friends, let's have that other night at home. You might have one night where you're working, let's have that other night at home, so that you're seeing your kids, your kids are seeing the siblings, that family time is important. I think it's also important to regularly express the spirit of gratitude, thanking each other for making the family time possible, thanking each other for making the efforts to put that first. Habit four is to think win-win. Um, as a family, we're all in this together and we're all in it to win it. So four ways of thinking of this win-win, this is an example um, that he gives, and it's a mundane example of the fight for the remote control. 
So just to help understand this language of win-win. So the win-lose scenario is that I get the remote and you get nothing. The lose-win situation would be that you get the remote and I get nothing. The lose-lose situation would be that we argue about the remote and I throw it against the wall, nobody gets anything. And the win-win situation would be, what if we turn off the TV and do something else entirely instead together? That's a win-win. So cultivating that sense of win-win. It could be cultivating, you know, um, you know, I don't, I'm going to keep going, but we'll keep moving. <laughs> you know the ideas for your families. You know those, those, those pitfalls that you may have. Habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. This makes me think so much of the peace prayer of St. Francis. Um, and at times, you know, I have it, even though many of us probably have it memorized, you know, I have it just written down something in my wallet or it's easy to find in pretty much every missile in, the, in each church. And I'll sometimes actually just make that when I come back after receiving communion, I'll just go through that prayerfully, peacefully, and I just ask for those graces to make me a channel of your peace. And that idea of seeking first to understand and then to be understood. Habit six, synergize. Um, so synergy is that sense of coming together, um, celebrating the differences. My husband and I are the exact opposite Myers-Briggs personality temperament. I'm extremely extroverted. That may come as a shock to you after everything I've just said. Um, my husband is the introvert. Um, I'm the conceptual, he's the concrete. Um, he's the planner, I'm the option open person. So I've actually had to learn to grow and to love planning, and I see it more as an act of, I'm saying I love you by putting together this plan because it actually doesn't come naturally to me. I'm very grateful that my mother was an excellent planner and my sister's an excellent planner. Um, so these difference in personality temperaments, celebrate them, don't fight them. You know, it brings so much to the table. I'm so happy for my children that they have parents that see the world through these different temperament lenses. That sense of teamwork. We make a great team as a family. Every single one is irreplaceable. Um, being open-minded. My way is not the only way of doing things. And finding new and better ways. Celebrating the many different ways to skin the cat. How boring would life be if everybody did everything the same way all the time? Celebrate the different ways of doing things. And that comes from a sense of valuing one another, not just tolerating, value them, love them, recognize that immeasurable value, recognize their strengths, and express gratitude. Habit seven is to sharpen the saw. I really needed this one explained to me. And so sharpen the saw comes from a story of a man sawing a tree and so the person goes up and sees this man sawing a tree and he's having a hard time at it. And so he goes, you know, if you sharpen the saw, you'd probably have a better time at trying to chop down this tree. But the man says he was too busy and he couldn't stop to sharpen the saw. And so this idea is that we are so much more effective when we stop and keep ourselves rested and keep ourselves sharp. It's that importance for resting and renewing. And so he breaks it into four categories. First is that sense of physical body, so exercising together. Um, you know, these physical activities that we do together, family hikes, family bike rides. Um, the other is the mental, learning new things together. When one person has um, a passion, so I have a son who loves geography. I remember th during COVID, we were like, okay, you love geography? One of my girls loves to cook. One of my kids loves music. Why don't we take a different country every week? And that was a real challenge in, in when you couldn't find ingredients, but we made it work, right? So learning together, bringing people's passions and everybody learning a little bit more and getting involved. Um, the spiritual element, pray together. Um, and then of course, the emotional element, um, building that love. I'm going to read to you a mission statement uh, for a family that Brene Brown put together. Um, it just covers a lot of what we talked about. Above all else, 
I want you to know that you are loved and lovable. You will learn from this, my words and actions. The lessons on love are in how I treat you and how I treat myself. I want you to engage with the world from a place of worthiness. You will learn that you are worthy of love, belonging, and joy every time you see me practice self-compassion and embrace my own imperfections. We will practice courage in our family by showing up, letting ourselves be seen, and honoring vulnerability. We will share our stories of struggle and strength. There will always be room in our house for both. We will teach you compassion by practicing compassion with ourselves first, then with each other. We will set and respect boundaries. We will honor hard work, hope, and perseverance. Rest and play will be family values, as well as family practices. You will learn accountability and respect by watching me make mistakes and make amends, and by watching how I ask for what I need and talk about how I feel. I want you to know joy so that together we will practice gratitude. I want you to feel joy so together we will learn how to be vulnerable. The uncertainty and scarcity visit, you will be able to draw from the spirit that is a part of our everyday life. Together we will cry and face fear and grief. I will want to take away your pain, but instead I will sit with you and teach you how to feel it. We will laugh and sing and dance and create. We will always have permission to be ourselves with each other. No matter what, you will always belong here. As you begin your wholehearted journey, the greatest gift that I can give to you is to live in love with my whole heart and to dare greatly. I will not teach or love or show you anything perfectly, but I will let you see me and I will always hold sacred the gift of seeing you. Truly, deeply seeing you. So building that sense of a family mission statement is worth it um, and coming back to it and drawing from it. Okay, so those seven habits. Um, finally, we're gonna take a look at this sense of communication masters and disasters and what we can learn from the Gottmans. So Kane Vox has a great article that is available online um, from the communication and marriage session, and that's where I'm getting a lot of these ideas. It's called The Four Most Common Relationship Problems and How to Fix Them by Eric Baker. I like it because it does a really good job of summarizing a lot of the valuable research from Dr. John Gottman. So these four horsemen of the relationship apocalypse. It's helpful to name it, claim it, so that we can tame it. So these four horsemen of the relationship apocalypse are, number one, criticism. This is where someone points to their partner or to a child in their family and says that their personality or character is the problem. John says, criticism is staging the problem in a relationship as a character flaw in a partner. Masters do the opposite. They point the finger at themselves and they really have a very gentle way of starting up the discussion, minimizing the problem, and talking about what they feel and what they need. So criticism, you know, saying things like, you're always late, you're so lazy, you're ungrateful, let's examine this. Am I being unrealistic with how long it takes my family to get out the door? You're always late. Maybe we as a family can build in more time to get out the door. And I distinctly remember the shoes. It was always the shoes. We could never find one shoe. We would find that shoe, and then the other shoe would go. So figuring out a place for the shoes. Defensiveness. This is responding to relationship issues by counterattacking or whining. We may get a lot of whining. Um, so here is John Gottman again. The second horseman was defensiveness which is a natural reaction to being criticized. So if criticism is on the table, defensiveness is likely to come. It takes two forms, counterattacking or acting like the innocent victim and whining. Again, the masters were very different when their partner was critical. They accepted the, criti the criticism and might have even taken responsibility for part of the problem. 
their response to criticism is to say, okay, let's talk about this. I wanna hear you, let's unpack this. The third is contempt. It's the number one predictor of toxic relationship and then further breakup. Contempt is acting like you're a better person than they are. Contempt is talking down to the partner, being insulting or acting superior. Not only did it predict relationship breakup, but it predicted the number of infectious illnesses that the recipient of contempt would have in the next four years when we measured their health. Contempt is toxic. It can take on a couple of different forms. It may take on uh, blame. Brene Brown has a really great video. It's maybe four minutes long. It's worth the watch about blame. And in it, it opens up and she talks about waking up one morning and she's having her cup of coffee and she spills the cup of coffee and it gets on her beautiful white pants. And her very first thought, the first thing that gets into her, into her mind is, Steve, that's her husband's name. She immediately just goes to blaming Steve. Steve wasn't home. In fact, he was at work and it was her cup of coffee and she's the one that dropped it. But she said blame, she recognized it had become so knee-jerk response for her that immediately she went to blame her husband. And then she explains it. You know, blame is that immediate way that we discharge frustration and anger and pinning it to someone. It makes us feel so good for maybe 0.5 of a second. And then as soon as we do it, there's usually that sense of recoil. But in response to that sense of recoil, some people end up blaming more and more and discharging more criticism and then comes contempt. She said, she explained why her husband's was the first name that came to her. He had been out late the night before with his friends. She had stayed up hoping he was gonna get home. He, you know, she didn't call, he didn't text. She's waiting, she's waiting, it's getting later, it's getting later. She's already finished her book, she's already watched her show. She was she's staying up, she's staying up. She's finally, she just falls asleep. So she wakes up in the morning. She'd already had a cup of coffee. She goes, this was my second cup of coffee. And I had to have my second cup of coffee because I was so tired. So of course, the immediate response was to blame my husband. She goes, no, 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 no. The whole point is I had to stop and I had to say, hey, Steve, when you're out, can you just text me when you're heading home? Or like that ETA, ETD, whatever, just give me a heads up. That was harder for her to do than to just immediately go into blame response. So contempt is toxic. If we recognize contempt, full stop. Do your breathing, do your prayer, do whatever it needs to kind of remaster that moment um, and to come back. Maybe it's our tone, a very contemptuous tone. What are the words that I'm saying? Name it, claim it, so we can tame it. The fourth is stonewalling. It's that complete shut down or tuning out. It's passively telling your partner, I don't care. And 80%, 85% of the time, it's the guys that do this. There's a Luminaire song, I'm a big fan of Luminaire's, the band, and there's a line where they say, the opposite of love's indifference. Stonewalling indifference hurts so much. It's fascinating that our brain actually processes rejection as pain. So the same part of our brain that responds to physical pain is the same part of the brain that responds to rejection. Stonewalling, rejection hurts. Name it, claim it, tame it. We don't want this in our families. We're not perfect, but when we recognize it's happening, full stop, recenter, come back with that apology, begin again. We can always begin again. So three things that make the four horsemen go bye-bye. The article says, number one, coming from, from Gottman, know your partner, know your family, know your children, know what they love, know what's gonna fill up those gas tanks, be proactive about it. Number two, responding positively to bids. I love this. If this is, if, could this be one of your takeaways? Um, let it be this. Bids are those opportunities to either turn towards our partner, to turn towards our child, or to turn away. The example in the article, you know, that, that I've heard before is this idea of, and it works well for our family because my husband teaches natural history and he's a, he's a natural history enthusiast. So it could be that, you know, I'm 
doing something. Let's say I'm in the kitchen. Let's say I'm making dinner. And he kind of walks by and he's looking out. And he goes, oh, look at that incredible goldfinch. And I'm sitting there. I can either be like, yeah, 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 yeah. Or I can be like, oh, well, not now, I'm doing work. Or I can stop what I'm doing for the two seconds it might take me to go, oh, yes, I see that goldfinch. It sure is yellow. And then turn back to my work, right? It's just an opportunity to say, this really has nothing to do with the goldfinch. They're pretty remarkable birds. Maybe you're into it, maybe you're not. But it's more about me saying, husband, you're pointing something out that you find fascinating, that you're interested in. I'm going to turn towards you because I love you, right? Or maybe it's your kids. Maybe we're in the middle of putting together a shopping list, doing the budget, grading papers, finding the missing shoes, right? And our kids come up to us and they go, oh, mom, you know, at school we read this really cool poem and it's about blah, blah. And we can either go, oh, tell me about it. Do you want to walk with me while I'm looking for those shoes? You know, but turning to the kid, responding to them, turning towards the other. It's a bid for affection. I've actually been bringing this to my prayer a lot, this idea of prayer being so important for family life, that first thing we have to take care of. And so when we think about these 10 minutes, we can think about it as that bid of our Lord saying, hey, Annie, remember that goal you had of those 10 minutes before Mass or those 10 minutes while you wait for pickup? Remember that idea you had? What do you think? I can see that turning towards the Lord, finding those bids, right? Um, those pictures we might have in our house, you know, turning towards, taking those moments to turn towards the Lord. So bids, responding to bids, so important. Fill up that gas tank with love. And number three is to show admiration. I'm sure you know when you, when you talk to somebody who's madly in love, right? Oh, they're so great. They're so wonderful. They're so this. They're so, you know that admiration that they have for their spouse, that admiration we have for our family, um, giving the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure they're just so tired. You know, you'll hear a mom say that, right? Oh, they missed their nap, they're a little cranky today, or we missed snack, you know, that's giving that child the benefit of the doubt. Let's not lose that, you know, let's know, you know, they, they've got that exam coming up, they've got that college deadline coming up, they've got, you fill in the blank, you know your family but just that admiration when we're with them that we carry in our heart, that spirit of admiration for our family. And then publicly how we talk about our family. Are we the type of person who's always complaining about our spouse, who's always complaining about our children? Or are we the kind of people that when we're talking with our friends, we're really looking at them with admiration, with a lot of love, and really talking them up to our family and our friends? Now, of course, with those mentor couples, you might have a struggle, you might have a challenge, and that would make a lot of sense to be, hey, mentor couple, I'm having a struggle here. I'm having a challenge. You know, this, this is an issue that's going on with one of my children. Do you have any, any tips or recommendations? You know, that's, that's different. But in general, you know, speaking positively, publicly and privately. So let's learn from the masters so we can avoid the habits of the disasters so to sum it up, the four things that kill relationship, criticism, defensiveness, contempt, stonewalling, and the three things that really prevent them to know our family, know our loved ones, to respond positively to those bids, and to admire our family. I guess in closing, before, before we do that, I want to share one more little trick that has really helped our family a lot. And it's this idea of core virtues. So this is something I discovered, I think, in 2004. And it was something that I used for work when I was doing the inner city outreach program. And it's something that our family has only ever done. We've only had this in our, in our family routine. And it's this idea of picking a virtue every month, a human virtue, um, and it's literature-based. So when I had little ones, it would be getting books from the library, there's a great book list, and just reading stories. It's that Socratic um, method of how virtue can be caught, but not necessarily taught. And so that's one way to kind of have this family culture where we're all speaking the same language of virtue. Um, we still use it today. This is actually what I'm teaching in, at Brookwood in the schools. Um, and at home, you know, my, my high schooler, 
he's probably gonna go off to college with like his little notes on, on the virtues of the month and we'll text him, you know, like, don't forget, this is September, respect and responsibility. But just find those little tricks, you know, to help us, to help us live family culture. So then in closing, I was really struck by today's second reading at Mass. So this is new, I wrote this before I came, this little closing part here, because I was praying a lot about you all. I was excited to come tonight. And so at Mass, I was praying, um, and the second reading kind of grabbed me by the heart, and it opens from St. Paul. He says, brothers and sisters, you are God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. But each one must be careful how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one that is there, namely Jesus Christ. Our families are the domestic church. In his letter to families, Pope St. John Paul II explained, the fathers of the church in the Christian tradition have spoken of the family as a domestic church, a little church. We must lay the foundation of our family life, cultivate this sense and the foundation that has to be on Christ, nurtured by our prayer. And only then can we build up intentionally and wisely our domestic church. And St. Jose Maria had a wise game plan for decision-making. He would say in the first place, prayer as our foundation and prayer about each member of our family, prayer about each need of our family. So in the first place, prayer, that firm foundation of prayer. In the second place, mortification. So we talked about how it takes effort to plan this family culture. Um, so let's offer up that effort as a prayer. And even thinking those little things throughout our day that we can offer for each one, each member of our family, for each one of them. Um, it could be just little things like punctuality with our meals. I'm gonna make that effort to do this on time and offer that for just this nourishing, this flourishing of our family life. And then finally, he puts action in the third place. So prayer, sacrifices for our family, and then action. So let's, let's get to it. Let's do it. Let's be in it to win it because building up our family culture with wisdom and intentionality is worth it. Excellent reflections on families and practical things. Uh, always good to work on virtues, which are difficult, require prayer. Let's um, maybe take 15 minutes, 15 minutes for some comments, questions, ideas. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, please stand and say it, kind of project so others can hear it as well. But then Annie, also if you could repeat the question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mary. What a great question, how we did family prayer each night in our family. So we have some prayers that I said as a child growing up. And so at the end of each day, after dinner, um, after chores, uh, we go up and the little ones, we still have some little ones, and the bigger ones, they take a pause. Um, and we do family prayers. Um, we, so our nighttime, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. So we do that one. Um, we do three Hail Marys. We pray for everybody in our family and our list is growing because we also include all of the aunts and uncles and cousins. Um, so we, we go through names, we pray for people. Um, and then we'll also at times even have them do like a little examination. It's like what went really, really well today? Thank you God for it. And they don't share it, you know, they just kind of think about it and pray about it. Um, what struggle did I have? What can I do better tomorrow? Um, but this idea of pausing prayerfully, um, the, those vocal prayers that I remembered as a child that now my children are saying as well, um, naming people, um, and then those three Hail Marys. And then we do family rosary. That's not always at bedtime. Usually half of them fall asleep if we try that. Um, but we do have another family habit of the rosary um, we go to it. it, it was so sweet actually. Um, family friends of ours, they were going through a really, really tough time. They had just lost a child. And the immediate reaction of, of one of my children at the time was, we've got to get the rosaries. So she runs upstairs, she brought the 
the handful of rosaries for everybody past the match because we have to say a rosary. So I think that's another habit of prayer. It's not necessarily at nighttime, um, but trying to cultivate that family rosary. Um, it's every day for some families, once a week for other families, but that idea that we're a family of the rosary and that we turn to it, it's a weapon of ours. Great question. Gosh, what a great question. So um, three children that you have, they're little. Uh, first of all, congratulations. Keep up the good work. Um, at that age, when your kids are little, those weekly date nights are important. They might look a little different right now. Um, at that stage, I remember we did a lot of um, cooking together, um, take out uh, different things, like things at home a lot, because it was harder for us to get up. But you know, keep, keep track of that family, that, sorry, the couple's date night and don't underestimate that value. First of all, to, for them to have the stability at home, um, know that they are from that loving family is huge. That's gonna anchor them in a way that we cannot take for granted. Um, my daughter Lillian, so she's our baby. I remember when she was three, one of her favorite things, this is a long way to get to your question by the way, but this is what came. Um, when she was three, one of her favorite things when my husband would come home from work is she would, you know, put one arm around Peter, she would put the other arm around me, so he'd be holding her, and she would just say, kiss each other hello again, right? So this holy kiss, this, she just wanted us together, and she would just love it, and she would just say, okay, I'm good now, and then she would go down and continue playing. So the first thing is take care of each other. Um, that's a huge, strong foundation they're gonna know that they've got an anchor of support, number one. So keep that up. What you're doing is great, keep it up. Know the truth, love the truth. Um, at this point, fill them with the true, the good, the beautiful. Uh, great stories, great movies. Um, let, them, let them get to know your family, you know, just your friends that, you know, that their stories that are being shared. Um, so surround them with the true, the good, the beautiful right now when they're little. Um, I mean, I'm gonna talk about, about the Canavox work. We have a great resource um, available on Amazon um, about laying the foundation with all the craziness that's going out there um, to help parents to talk to their children at age-appropriate levels about these issues. Um, so that has been an invaluable research, uh, resource for us in our family, Canavox. Um, and then I guess I would also say don't be afraid of presenting the truth with a lot of love, but without holding back. Um, so effective and loving language is gonna be important. And I think you'll find that through sharing struggles with friends, um, getting tips, this has worked well for me. Um, I mean, it's, it feels a little bit like a cop out to just say Canavox is a great resource, but it's something that I happen to know really, really well. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that later um, and, and to be in touch, you know, directly about that. So that's been an invaluable resource for us. Yes. So Canavox is an organization uh, that, that strives to give the natural law voice to marriage between one man and one woman um, and human sexuality. Um, you can find it online. I happen to be the, the Maryland state leader, so I'm happy to, to be a resource and to answer questions to anybody about that. Um, the way that it works is through reading groups. So it could be for couples. Um, my husband and I host couples groups. Um, they also have college groups, so I've led college groups um, on these topics. Um, there are Canavox JV for high school and for middle school students. Um, but really it's about celebrating 
the truth of what marriage is, um, and then the other topics that are out there are rapid onset gender dysphoria, um, same-sex marriage, same-sex parenting, uh, pornography. I mean, a lot of these tough topics that are out there, there's a lot of research that's been done about how to express the truth, to understand um, the pitfalls of a lot of these a lot of these topics, but to give people a lot of hope, encouragement, and community. Yes. What's the name of the Core Virtues book? Sure. Um, this is Core Virtues by Mary Beth Klee. Um, you can find this online. Mary Beth Klee. How do you spell that? Yep, so Mary Beth and then K-L-E-E. -E. Um, it's beautiful, I love it. So this is kind of to that idea of giving them the true, the good, the beautiful right now. Um, she takes a human virtue each month. Um, so September will always be respect and responsibility. And then sure, there's like a, a bite-sized definition um, that's easy to, to memorize, essentially. But again, it's, it's about seeing the virtue lived out through storytelling, and you see characters that either heroically um, live the virtue or sometimes those moments of, oh no, I remember, because I teach this curriculum in a school now at, at Brookwood, um, one of the stories we read, it's called Hidden in Sand, and it's about diligence and how somebody basically uh, doesn't make the right choice um, as they're leading a group in a caravan in the desert. Um, and they pour out all the water and the, and the students are all saying, why would they do that? And so part of it is learning sometimes through the bad choices characters make um, and then how, you know, how to reclaim it and how to, you know, how to, how to win in the end by finding the, the virtue and how to implement it. Um, I mean, if you're interested, there's a podcast on the Brookwood website um, about the curriculum um, or also just going online to thecorevirtues.net, I think it is. Uh, but it's a, it's a treasure. I love it. You mentioned uh, your core group, core couples that you try to get together once a season. Um, do you have other uh, kind of ongoing connections with friends, other families, other couples? Um, I mean, I'll, I mean, book club I mentioned already, but there's something about literature I find. So when you get together and you have something you've shared. So at one point I remember doing a movie club because it was just easier at that time to have, you know, the couples get together having seen, having all watched the same film um, and talk about kind of its cultural significance, its, its historical significance. But I think, you know, coming together and sharing a meal, there's something beautiful about the conversations that can happen around a dinner table um, or finding articles to discuss. So you've got something meaningful and meaty to kind of dig into together. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the big things is just finding the time to make it regular. Um, once a month, you know, every other month, but just getting it on the calendar. And then, you know, if it's not before the, the event ends, you know, shortly thereafter, getting the next one to look forward to, I think is probably the magic. Um, that's what the key is. So you do it once and that's great, but then immediately following up to get that secondary, third, you know, just building that tradition. Um, I think is really valuable. So again, sharing a meal, um, a book, a movie, a short article, because we are busy, let's face it. And it could be a podcast, everybody reads a podcast. And so even if most of it is just sharing the meal, but then you spend like a focused 10, 15 minutes about, okay, what do we all take away from this? Um, I think sharing different perspectives is great because we'll approach, you know, with my friend who she and I lead this, and we've been doing it for 12 years, we have very different personalities. And so I think it's helpful um, examining something as a group because we have our personality, we have our temperament. Um, sometimes it's almost like the lens that we see the world. Um, so we might read something or watch a movie and have a, a very particular Annie take on the movie. Um, but then you hear an insight that somebody else provides and it has you look at it from a completely different perspective. And that is so valuable. Um, and in some ways cultivating that sense through um, a book or a movie that a lot of people shared and loved will help us when a challenging topic comes up 
to say, I know how to listen. I know how to be open to hearing a different perspective. And by really being able to listen and, and hear from somebody else, then if, they're, if it's erroneous, if it's absolutely wrong, by hearing where they are, I'll be able to help get them back on track, right? So cultivating that, that sense of being able to listen, I think is really good. Yes. Respond to their bids. Those bids of affection. Respond to bids. Yep. Great question. That's an important one and a fun one. All of a sudden, when you start to see things as bids, it gets really sweet. You're like, oh, I see what this is. It's not about the bird. <laughs> it's about giving that opportunity to turn towards you in this moment. And it's really beautiful. I mean, developing that with our spouse but then really seeing how that, that plays into our relationship with our children and just turning towards the other. Okay, again, Anne, thank you very much. Really blessed to have you here with us. How many uh, here tonight have children in our school? St. Louis School, some children in our school? A few? We're really trying to do an endeavor uh, similar to what Anne was describing of connecting parents within a grade. We realize um, our children may be in the same grade, but that doesn't mean we really know each other, especially during COVID, we got separated. So intentional effort to reconnect with couples in the grade and uh, just invite, you know, try to get to know one or two or three couples and then invite them over. For, invite them to a parish event like a speaker series or invite them to your house. One concept is, as Anne had kind of alluded to too, as well, take back Sunday. Invite someone to your house on Sunday and that gives you a chance to have some family time as well. You're not gonna go out shopping or run errands or which we shouldn't do as Christians anyway, but uh, reclaim Sunday as a day of family day and a day of rest. And so maybe invite one or two or three couples over, have like a play date for the children, have food, but then some adult conversation, maybe pick a podcast or an article or a little video or something um, that you can discuss. So I highly encourage that. And then maybe it's a monthly reconnecting with a few families from the grade or you take turns uh, doing it at different homes or something like that but those efforts to spend time with families but also making it significant talk about something of substance uh, something of a spiritual nature uh, draw that into the conversation at some point in the gathering as well so uh, if there are those who might be interested in cultivating a, a discussion group a reading group for Cana Vox we would love to have that at St. Louis, uh, either just among parishioners or among school parents, possibly even among school faculty. So if you have some interest to learn more, talk to Ann afterwards, or go to the website, or talk to me. And happy to follow that conversation. I had learned about Cana Vox at a priest retreat. One of the one of the leaders, one of the women came in, and we watched some of the videos, which are beautiful, and um, how to talk about these issues in in polite ways, in considerate ways. There are people involved, people are struggling. It might be your child who's struggling with these questions or your brother or sister. So they're, they're, they're difficult topics, but how to talk about it in a um, kind of a natural and a considerate way. We do, as you leave today, there's a flyer with some of the upcoming speakers. Please take it home. Uh, maybe maybe this is like your, your, your get together with some other families at the next one, which is uh, two months from now, every two months. We try to have national and local speakers and Anne's kind of a little bit of both. Um, but uh, thank you for being here tonight and let's say a closing prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Lord Jesus thank you for the good insights and inspirations you have given us tonight help us to put them into effect in our own personal lives in our marriages and in our families all for your glory Lord as we pray glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. We ask for the prayers of our mother Mary and St. Joseph, the Holy Family, upon our families. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. And we'll be in the back uh, to maybe take some conversations. So good.